welcome to lecture 8 in our series and if you remember well last time we were do dealing with the canonical quantization of a scalar field and I want to start uh, by just remembering where we are right so we started with this Lagrangian right here well it's a Lagrangian for a scalar field so this is a field that for each point in space-time associates just one number and it does not transform under Lorentz transformation as a, I call to your attention last time these coefficients here are quite arbitrary at this point but of course I have chosen them uh, conveniently for the physical interpretation they will have later right? and I, I, I insist on the point that that uh, interpretation depends a lot on what is here and how you treat this potential so this is not trivial at all right? and, and of course this Lagrangian Classically, when I, I take this uh, potential to zero, I have shown that uh, we get the Klein Gordon equation. So, we're really now dealing with the fields that uh, obey the Klein Gordon equation. Uh, so, and but we are getting this equation just by uh, taking a field that transforms in a particular area, in this case, a scalar under Lorentz transformation, and writing. Uh, the most uh, general thing under some extra constraints for instance i want this to be bounded from below so i i remove the odd powers of phi right and, and then uh, um, we want to quantize this theory now our degrees of freedoms are the fields and the conjugate momentum to to those fields and i impose the commutation relations between these two right uh, basically going and finding the Poisson brackets on the classical uh, theory field theory and turning the Poisson brackets into uh, commutators and then I noticed that uh, at least in momentum space and if you go to momentum space you you see that the solutions to the klein gordon equation are very similar to a harmonic oscillator almost identical to the harmonic oscillator in fact so what i did was to then approach the problem in the same, same way you would a harmonic oscillator so first we rewrite the fields in terms of a and a dagger operators right if these guys are operators these are operators too and then you can derive the commutation relations between a and the dagger from the commutation relations that you put for phi and pi right the usual uh, harmonic oscillator story and we got these um, um, commutation relations for the a and a daggers and i wrote the hamiltonian in terms of in terms of these where again uh, you see the hamiltonian is written in momentum space and you, you see here basically uh, um, uh, Hamiltonian for a harmonic oscillator but with a continuously varying uh, frequency right this omega of p depends on this uh, momentum I'm integrating here and, and, and it varies uh, continuously because I have an integral here uh, and, and and then to understand a little better the spectrum of this theory because uh, at first you deal with the operators of the theory which are here right but but eventually you have to build a um, Hubert space and and look at the spectrum and and in order to do that it is easier to consider the case where uh, the field lead, lives in a finite space of volume V say because that discretizes the normal modes of the field right i'm doing this full here transforms here and decomposing the field in its full here component so if i put it in a box i i, I discretize that and and the, that discretization turned my hamiltonian which was this integral over these uh, continuously varying frequencies into a sum over discrete uh, uh, frequencies and then uh, just as a matter of um, uh, fixing dimensions and all I, I, I change uh, A which is the operator in the continuum uh, limit for alpha which is the same thing in the discrete version right and then it's clear that this is a sum of oscillators right each the, I have a, a, an oscillator for each frequency 
frequency k here for each mode k and uh, I have this sum over these what I call little h Hamiltonians which are just ham Hamiltonians for harmonic oscillators with the usual uh, story right I can define a Fox space for each of these little h Hamiltonians and and each of them will be exactly a harmonic oscillator so this is how far we got with the case where I have a free scalar field by free I mean this right I'm now looking at really a simplest like range and I can think of which is just these first two terms and that looks like a sum of harmonic oscillators in the discrete limit and, and, and in the in the continuum limit is an integral so they're very similar right? so now we want to take this this um, further and start working on the Hilbert space of the whole theory hmm? which is not hard right if you think about this let's keep this expression here right? if you think about this right? Uh, the Hamiltonian of the system is just the sum of Hamiltonians, right? This is all, all operators, right? And that means that the Hilbert space of the sum right, will be the direct product of the, 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 all these Fox spaces for, for, for each of these Hamiltonians, right? So you have a set, if you, st you stick to this little h Hamiltonian, you have a set of uh, Fox spaces, let's indicate like that, right? You have uh, states that are like 1, 0 is the same for everyone, but 1, 2, and so on and so forth, right? For each mode k, right? Once I specify a value of k, I have a Fox space for it. And you have a set of many of those Fox spaces if I keep, so this is a set over k. Right, and now I'll define a state that I'll indicate like that. Which belongs to the direct product in K right? in, of, of these, uh, of all the Fox spaces that are in here, right? So there's many ways I can specify that. Suppose there was only three modes, right? A, a, a typical uh, state could be indicated like that, right? It's zero excitations on the first mode, zero on the second, and one excitation on the third mode, or two excitations on the third mode, and one on the first, you know? You could just specify, because these, these harmonic oscillators, in this case, they're completely independent from each other, right? There's just no interaction between them. So each of them can have excitations which are completely independent of the others, right? And it has many ways I can indicate this. In some places you see that uh, indicated like this, like a product over k uh, of n k, but you have to be careful. This is not just a multiplication, right? This is a direct product of these states. But being more formal, the best way of uh, actually writing out these guys, and, and now it's really a product, right, is to write it like this. Under the assumption that they all have the same, act on the same vacuum, right? Because then I'm having a product of over all case, or all case, right? And I apply a certain number of creation operators on the vacuum, and I create excitations in one of those modes, depending on this list of n k's that is implicit here, right? So, uh, to be concrete, for instance, uh, 1, 0, 1, right? Would mean that n for the first k is 1, uh, 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 let's call it n k n k one is one n k two is zero n k three is one so this becomes just 
over one over square root of one times one, another one of those, and, and alpha dagger k1 alpha dagger k3 acting on the vacuum, right? Remember that uh, the commutation relation between those alphas tell me tells me that if k's are different, they commute, so th there's no actually no meaning in the order here. I can pass one by the other and I'm creating two excitations, one on the mode k1 and another one on the mode k2. And I could do that for more excitations and then there's just a certain power of creation acting on the vacuum and some normalization factors. Right? It's, it's pretty straightforward. Right? So that's how states for the free scalar field look like. Right? like a superposition of oscillators. And of course, it may not be trivial to imagine the continuum limit, but it's basically just uh, the same thing, but with less and less distance between neighboring modes. Right? You, you, you're putting more and more modes close together all the way until you, you go into the continuum. And this is the, the, the space, the fo also called this Fox space of uh, the scalar field. Right? Of course, uh, in the same way as the harmonic oscillator, I have a, a, a zero point energy here, right? So if I calculate, I take any of these small discrete Hamiltonians and I, I calculate the expectation value of little h for any of those modes in the vacuum, of the theory, right? I get something which is just omega k over two. I right? remember we have a h bar hidden here by natural units, right? This is one. So I have the the same uh, zero point energy that I have in any oscillator, right? Uh, but you see now, um, since the finite volume, right? The finite volume discretizes my spectrum, puts a cut on a minimum frequency, but put, does not put a cut on the maximum frequency, right? I can increase k as much as I want, right? In this great way, but as much as I want. That means that if I sum over all the energies, right? Because this is the energy. Uh, of the system is, is the sum of many of those, right, over k. But this sum over k goes all the way to infinity. That means that the energy, the zero point energy, no excitation, I'm just taking the vacuum here, right, is, is, is going, is blowing up, right, it's going to infinity, right, which cannot be unobservable, right, in this case, I have an infinite zero point energy, but the story is the same with the harmonic oscillator. This is, has to do with the certainty principle, and, and I, I cannot take away that energy from the vacuum, right? There's no way of taking that out, right? So, this is, this is uh, uh, of course, not what I'm interesting, interested in. So I want to measure energies in relation to that vacuum. And the way to define a quantum theory that only looks at energy in relation to this minimum energy, which I'm calling the vacuum, it doesn't matter if it's a, a lot of energy, I'm still taking that at the ground, as the ground level and going up. Right, is to normal order these Hamiltonians, and again, it's the same story as before, right? As uh, if I take the normal ordering of H, I'm still thinking of the discrete k's here, so I put a sum on k, there's omega k over 2, right? and the normal ordering will just take al uh, alpha dagger alpha plus alpha dagger alpha, so I'm exchanging these two guys, right, which amounts to the same as uh, subtracting, right? It is the same if I take the non-normal order Hamiltonian and I subtract these, uh, these infinite energy from it, right? This subtracting is important, right? You see 
that is this is, is kind of the first very simplified very naive case of uh, renormalization that we're seeing right and, and we'll, we'll talk more about that later but the important thing is that I can define a quantum theory as the, the, the observable um, I define the observables and operators that are relevant to my theory to be all normal order from the start right and and then I have a sensible um, um, I have a sensible uh, quantum theory that has uh, finite energies that I can actually are the ones I measure right and this of course the expectation value of this guy is zero and now in general use for a more generalized vacuum and more generalized operators I'll, I'll be looking at oops I'll be looking at normal ordered operators to avoid uh, problems like this right this omega that I'm using here is the vacuum of a more general theory where I this is the vacuum of the Lagra of the Lagrangian uh, for the Lagrangian where V0 right so free harmonic oscillator you always free scalar field I'll always call the vacuum just zero and for more general cases where there is some potential there is some you see that this potential leads to interactions right then I'll call the vacuum Omega it's just the lowest uh, line state the state with no excitation now let's notice uh, what happens when the, the field acts on the vacuum right so the field apart from another a lot of normalizations and and uh, sums over momenta is basically a sum of annihilation operators accompanied by this exponential right here right this is four momentum four position right plus a dagger p the creation uh, operator exponential of i p x right, with p0 equal e p right and and um, I, there are sums over p integrals actually over p and all the normalization but none of that matter for, for what i want to show right and e p remember was the same as uh, omega p which is defined as a positive number right p square plus m square which is bigger than zero right it's positive so what happens when the the field itself acts on this state so now i define the states of the theory right this is this uh, fox space right in the continuum limit of this right? and uh, the field either creates excitations of momentum p right or annihilates them if they exist on the vacuum otherwise this part is zero right and this comes accompanied by this uh, exponential which will be we'll see soon uh, sort of the wave function of of um, something that is created right we'll see that i have a particle particle interpretation of this theory and and and, and this is the wave function the first term here uh, has a uh, a wave function let's call it right for now that is what you expect right in the metric we're using I change the sign of the the um, spatial part and I keep the sign of the time part so that will be uh, minus energy or Omega whatever you want T right which is just uh, uh, if you look at the time evolution for that um, state is just yeah, minus i e p t which, which is what you expect right but for the second term it will be the opposite right you have now a time evolution that if you want to interpret these in terms of the shredding equation so let's take the non-relativistic limit and, and this is this is like an evolution in time with the wrong sign right or the energy is defined positive 
by the way, I did the calculation omega p was defined positive from the start. But the solution is evolving in time with the wrong sign, which has a lot of different interpretations, right? But the point to notice here, we call this, right, because of these two, it's usual to call these the positive energy or positive frequency solutions and these the negative energy or the negative frequency solutions. I prefer negative uh, frequency, but this is all, all names, right? All just names. Because if you think about it, the Hamiltonian, right, which is the operator that really measures the energy of any state, has a spectra which is given by this. And both these numbers are positive, right? Because this is the number operator that counts the number of excitations with wave number k, right? So the energy is always positive in this uh, in this system. So we have no negative energy independent of these two possible wave solutions to to the Klein-Gordon equation, right? and and someone might actually say, hey, hey, you're trying to fool me here, right? Because at, at some point we had, when you were solving uh, um, Klein-Gordon equation in a momentum space, right? You had something like this, and you, you took the square root, and, and you made a choice here, right? Omega is only positive because you choose it, you chose it to be so. But, but that's not true, because if you go back and you see the solutions I was uh, uh, using to the Klein-Gordon equation in, in momentum space, right? the solutions were just the most general thing. Right? The most general thing. So taking... Uh, um, plus or minus. Here is carried over to this plus or minus that I, that, I, that I put here. And I can take omega to be positive with no loss in generality. I have only two solutions and not four of them. So I didn't really lose any generality by assuming omega is positive. right? And then when I, I, I take this and I, I exchange the field and it's uh, conjugate momentum by A and A dagger, right? It was the properties of A and an A dagger that dictated uh, who would come close to each of these exponentials. In fact, when when you look at the, how I got the time evolution of uh, A and A dagger, right? You see that I solved this equation here, right? I del dt of a is equal to a dagger h, a similar one for a dagger, right? And and that led me to this uh, time evolution that you see right there, right? So the annihilation operator evolves as you would expect from uh, the Schrodinger equation, and, and the creation operator evolves in the opposite way. Right? This is fixed. This is independent of the signal of the metric we use. It, this is independent of... Uh, of course, you can invert the definitions of A and A dagger, but then you also invert who's the creation and who's the annihilation operator. So you're not doing much there. Right? So, important points to keep in mind. While you keep hearing when you're reading uh, uh, books on quantum field theory, you keep hearing about the positive energy or the positive frequency and negative frequency or negative energy solutions, but it, it's important to keep in mind that the spectrum is now positive. So, energies are positive, and that's already... Uh, different from what we had uh, when you got to the Klein-Gordon equation through the second uh, quantization uh, uh, logic, right? In just 
trying to do relativistic quantum mechanics, you had positive and negative energies here. We have a well-defined spectrum, it's the Hamiltonian, and this is positive definite because omega is positive. And I, 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 I didn't make any choice when I made omega positive. I keep full generality of the solutions of the equation I had, right? Uh, and, and still got a, a positive definite uh, spectra right, for my theory. In fact, the real rigorous way of defining the energy right, would be to Nether's theorem. Right? And that's uh, how we, we start seeing the, the particle interpretation of the theory. So I have shown a few lectures ago that the conserved quantity uh, of um, space-time translation is the the um, stress energy tensor, right? Is this, is this object right here, right? The only phi minus Lagrangian delta mu nu, right? And if we keep in mind the Lagrangian of the free theory, the only phi, the only phi minus m square over 2 phi square and substitute here, right? What we see that uh, if we take only time translation, so we, we, we think only about the component, let me do it like that, and, 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 and the component 0, 0 of that object, right? and write it explicitly, so I do these derivatives and, 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 and write it explicitly, what I get is the integral, and this is the conserved quantity, right? This is the conserved current related to time translation, so I put 0, 0 here because I'm taking the time component of this. This is the current and I'm integrating over all space to get the, co the total conserved quantity, right? And, and if I use this expression on this Lagrangian, what I get is pi x phi dot x minus L d3x, which is the Hamiltonian density, right? Of course, then the total conserved quantity, which I shouldn't have written at the start, is is the Hamiltonian. So you see that what I, I'm calculating above is really the operator associated with the quantity that is conserved uh, by invariance in, in, in time translations, and that is the energy. Right? Uh, I could do the same to other quantities, and that's where the nice things start to appear. Right? I could take the time, the, the space translations, right? And remember that we had a continuity equation that was something like this, right? So the space translation part is just this one, right? Just summing over the space spatial com uh, components of this the equation. And of course, the zero component here is the density of the quantity that is conserved. And the other three uh, indexes are the fluxes of these uh, of of this quantity. So the, the since the density is t zero i, then the the total conserved quantity is the uh, integral in space of of that quantity, right? Again, if we take this component here, this part goes away, right? I only have uh, pi del i of phi, right? I just have to use this Lagrangian up there and take this component. Of course, d3x. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I'm calling, by definition, the momentum, right? These are the three components of the momentum contained in these excitations. It's very important here to differentiate this from the conjugate momentum, which is pi, has nothing to do with this, right? And from the p's that have been integrating when I I do the integral over there, because this is is actually the Fourier modes of the field, 
right? They, they will be related to each other, but they are not the same thing. This is really an operator. It's written in terms of the operators. And this is really the, the operator that, uh, in a given state, right, the, the, spec the, the value of this operator is the, mom the quantity, right, uh, that is really related to the translations in space. Actually, I should have an I here, right? To, to, to translations in space. So this is the momentum. Right, and uh, in other words, I can write this in vectorial form just to to give a better uh, expression. And of course, now I can substitute the expressions of phi and pi in terms of in terms of a and a dagger here, right? And 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 get what re I'm really after, which is let me copy this guy down here. But this is also the same as the integral on the three p. Notice in all these expressions, I'm going back to the continuum limit of this, but it's very easy to go back and forth. Uh, to the discretized version in this one, right? And now this is this is quite nice, right? A a dagger p a p because again we have the number operator here. Again, I have the num number operator here, and since this operator is appearing both here. And in the Hamiltonian here, well, I have Hamiltonian. This is the discretized one, but you remember the, the continuum one, right? That means that when I count the number of excitations, say with a mo fixed momentum p, right, uh, I'll get p times the number of excitations momentum and omega times the number of excitations energy. And these two quantities are related by the definition of omega that I'm calling energy, and now with good reason, which is this one, right? This is the same p I was using, the little p, not to be confused with this one. I'm trying to indicate my capital P with this on the bottom because my writing really makes no difference between that. Right? But this is, this is nice, right? That means that each of these excitations carry a certain amount of energy that comes from the Hamiltonian operator and carries a certain quantity of momentum, which is coming from this operator, straight from Nether's theorem. You couldn't go more, more rigorous than that to define momentum. Right? And these two are related by a, a relativistic dispersion relation. So each of the excitations will satisfy that, which is the first very strong indication that these are really particles, right? And relativistic particles are that, and justifies that freaking number that I put at the Lagrangian at the start. Now, at least for the free theory, so keep in mind, free theory, all I did here, V was zero, right? But for the free theory, that coefficient that was in front of the phi square term in the Lagrangian, I put a minus m square over 2 here. So this choice here brings uh, the together, brings with it, once I look at the spectrum of the theory, of the free theory, right? Uh, the fact that this m that I chose here was really the mass, right? If I started with just b phi square here, I would get a more complicated expression here, right? But then I would just make, well, if I want to, to really uh, interpret this relation between energy and momentum, right? Uh, this, whatever appears here, needs to be the mass square. Right? And then I would make this identification, right? Immediately. I have a dispersion 
which looks like a relativistic one. So if I measure something with energy E and momenta P, I know that the quantity that relates these two is the mass. And I would make this identification and go back to the Lagrangian for the free theory. And this is only for the free theory, as you'll see. So keep that in mind. But we are going towards the particle Identif uh, I mean, interpretation of these quantum field theories. This is not, not enough, but it it is, I mean, the first, uh, how would call it, uh, requirement, right? So the, the energy spectra and the momentum spectra should satisfy this relation, and they do, for any momentum, right? Always with the same coefficient, too. If this coefficient depended on momenta, for different momenta would be... A, not the right one, but I have a number here, which is by definition the mass. That's how I define mass here, right? Uh, so that's important, right? We'll see what happens. This theory has n not many other conserved quantities, but we'll see what happens uh, when 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 I go to a more a little bit more complicated Lagrangian that does have. What can be done here is angular momentum. You can also prove a similar uh, uh, statement for angular momentum, well, but I won't do it here. Another important thing is is related to statistics of this theory, right? We know that uh, we know that the relation between a dagger of k and a dagger of k prime, so two different momenta, are, is zero, right? And that means that I take, if I take a state, right, which is just any state now, defined by some wave function that just, it's just this, right? I'm just taking k1, k2, phi, k1, k2, alpha, dagger of k1, alpha, dagger of k2. So you see, it's a state that has one excitation, k1, one excitation, k2, combined into some way, and that's why I'm doing this sum, right? I'm summing over various different uh, K1s and K2s, so I'm summing over different possibilities of creating two momenta states with some weights that are fixed here, right? And this is what I call the, the wave function that defines this state, because I, of course I can put a, a bra here and and uh, and, and and get this wave function out, right? Projected on what would be the equivalent of a well-defined position. That we'll get that to 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 that later, right? Or well-defined momentum. What I want to show here, what's more important, is what happens uh, if I exchange k1 for k2. So this is this is really a sum. So I can just relabel. In here, I'm not doing no. I'm, I'm doing nothing, right? I'm just calling k1, k2, and calling k2, k1, right? So I can put k2 here. I can put k1 here. Same, same thing here and here. And because of this relation, they commute. Right? Alpha, I, I went back to the discretized limit, right? But we know that the same is true for, for alpha. Right? Well, alpha is are the alphas are the discretized A's. Right? That means I can commute these two guys. And the conclusion here is that uh, psi k1 k2 is equal to psi k2 k1. Right? In other words, um, 
exchanging the states of two of these, uh, let's call, particles. So I have, at first I had the first particle at momenta k2 and the second one at momenta k1, and now I did the opposite, right? Now it's, it's, it's the opposite, you see in the wave function here. Huh? Uh, the, there's no change in the wave function when I do that. I'm just exchanging two particles which are totally in, uh, indistinguishable and the wave function stays the same, which show that they follow a Bose-Einstein uh, statistics, right? This is a bosons. Uh, there's no uh, asymmetry or anti-symmetry in the, in the wave function. So I'm dealing with bosons here, and that's uh, a first um, sign of something much deeper that I'll come back to later when I'm doing quantization of Dirac, uh, let's say the Lagrangian that leads to the Dirac equation and, and the fields that there are in that Lagrangian. Uh, but for now, it's important to see that I didn't impose these, right? This, this is appearing just out of these commutation relations and the fact that the field was uh, in a certain representation of the Lorentz group at the start, right? And, and I got bosons. Hmm? So that's, that's, uh, that's important, right? So that's the second part of, uh, the, it's still part of my particle interpretation, not only I have excitations that satisfy the special, the, the disper relativistic dispersion relation, but I also have particles that behave as bosons, right? I can, uh, the, the state of two particles is symmetric under the exchange of particles. Well, what we want now is to look more closely into the relativistic aspects of uh, this, uh, this theory. So there's, there's a few things we need to do. First, we need to be sure that uh, we know how the, the states transform under uh, Lorentz boosts and uh, are, are we doing... Uh, I mean, I didn't talk a lot about how how well the normalizations I choose for those states go with uh, relativity. And, and, and the second one, we, we want to tackle causality, right? Well, we, I mean, we basically gave away uh, relativistic uh, quantum mechanics because negative energies, that is fixed already for the Klein-Gordon equation, and, and causality, right? Uh, Oh, there was also negative probabilities, but this is this is also already fixed because the negative probabilities were coming from negative uh, um, uh, energies. But we will we'll have to see what what are the probabilities here, and we we'll only get to that once we get to the observables. But right now, what I want to tackle is causality and the normalization of the states. In the discretized uh, version of it, we had define the states like this. Acting on the vacuum. And of course that led to this normalization. Hmm? Uh, and and remember uh, the relation of these uh, operators and the continuum create creation and annihilation operators is this one that that's how we define the alphas right by this relation and, and now I want to also start using a notation that will be more useful for us in the future and uh, it's, it's, it's the one we use once we start really interpreting these as particles, which is that uh, the 1k states, or I mean there's one excitation with momentum k, many times we just 
indicate like that. It's just a particle, the state of one particle with momentum k, right? Which is given by just alpha acting on the vacuum. Hmm? So I'm defining now this notation and we'll use it a lot. Right? And, and, and that means that if I take the normalization, this normalization, and take it to the continuum, hmm? I'll, I'll have that P K. Right? Uh, again, remembering that uh, another relation that I had between continuum and uh, discrete versions was this one. And this is the transition from discrete and continuum, and same here discrete and uh, continuum, or a Kronecker. This is a Kronecker and this is a Dirac delta. Right? I can transform this relation into, just by using these two uh, um, uh, relations here, I can write this uh, normalization conti uh, condition in the continuum. Hmm? The issue of this, uh, the issue with the, this condition is that the Dirac delta is not invariant under boosts. In fact, one can show that uh, under a boost in, say, the Z direction, the Dirac uh, delta transform as follows, right? So the delta tree of p k is equal to the delta tree. Now I made a boost, so all the momenta change to a p prime k prime, right? Uh, times this relation between energies and the previous referential, which is e here, and e prime, which is the the, the energy in the new referential. Right? So it's not invariant. What is invariant. Just looking at this expression is this quantity. So energy times the Dirac um, delta is invariant. And that tells us what is the good normalization to use. So I'll exchange this normalization for an invariant one, which means that if I normalize my states in one referential, they will be uh, normalized in all of them. So uh, I'll use this one. P Q will be the bracket of P and Q will be two times the energy two pi cube. Of course this two is totally arbitrary, it's just to uh, you see. You can conceal out a factor two that appears almost everywhere, together with energy. And this is the normalization of use. So since I'm, I'm I'm changing the normalization of my states, I have to do it consistently. So I have to go back to all the expressions that I I have used in, in the lecture today and and part of the last lecture and, and revise them to this new normalization. Right? In particular, to an arbitrary, I can do this for an arbitrary number of states and make it look like that, right? So now I have any number of, of excitations here with momenta ki, another arbitrary number of excitations here with momenta kj, uh, right? And the normalization will be over all, I mean, this is the sum, over all the permutations of the initial states, because this needs to be zero. If I don't have at least, I have a certain set of momenta here, and another set there, right? Uh, this set, if I, I do a lot of permutations of this set, it must be equal to that one, in some of these permutations, otherwise this needs to be zero. So every momenta here needs to be matched to every momenta there, but not in a, in a precise order. Any order here, if it matches there, 
this will be different from zero. I mean, it will be the 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 delta function that I'm about to write at the right here. So I can make the product of i, right, two omega k i, which is the same as the energy, right, k i, two pi cube, which is the same as here. Mm -hmm. And the direct delta of k i, I'm just organizing all momenta here, right? Minus k pi j in a particular permutation, right? So you see what happens here. What's what's happening here, right? I'm, I'm taking every time a particular permutation on this side matches exactly the set of momentum on the left, this will be different from zero and will be normalized as, as we want. If some permutation here does not match what is there, this is zero. And I'm testing over all of them. Right? So for uh, I think I think that's clear, right? So that's the normalization for an arbitrary number of um, operators. But of course, to get this normalization, I need to change this, right? This one leads through this dictionary to this one. And this is the known invariant one. I want that. So I need to change the definition of my states in terms of the vacuum, right? And the way to do that is to put an extra factor of uh, 2 omega. In fact, square root of 2 omega, because I have the state twice here. So now, I'll just write uh, my state nk, the one particle state as, I mean, for one momenta only, uh, as 1 over square root of nk factorial. And now I have an extra 2, sorry, square root of 2 omega k alpha dagger k and k acting on the vacuum. So this is uh, this is how I define those states and of course if I use this here I get that definition and if I want for many states right, for a set of excitations with different momenta I need to have a product of many of those, right? So this is how I define my states now in terms of the vacuum, right, which is just a change in normalization. Now, if I go to the continuum, what happens? I need to use the, the dictionary above and exchange alpha by a, a, a and a dagger, right, and that allows me to define the state Ki, it's just a set of particles with momenta, will be defined as, again, the product of K, all, all the Ki, right? One number of particles in state k factorial acting on zero, in which is implied that the states on the left-hand side of 
these equations are also related by a similar um, power of um, volume and all coming from the discretization, right? So this guy here, when I discretize or go back to the continuum, it, it's, it's, uh, it goes into product over k of square root of 2 p pi cube v to the power n k n k right which is the only consistent thing that you can do if you think alpha acting on zero a acting on zero need to generate those guys and between a and alpha there is a factor square of v 2 pi cube and so the states on the left side I also need to use this dictionary right so that's how you do this this um, uh, transition to the continuum back to the continuum right and uh, of course this equation we use it a lot and I have to specialize it for the one particle state right which is uh, this one excitation state I I don't want to call uh, these one particle states until I fully convinced you that these are particles but you know old habits they die hard I mean it's uh, I'm already used to call these particles so far I haven't pr totally proven that yet I mean I'm inducing you right uh, but okay, the one excitation state is this one. Now I have this square root of two, energy, uh, square root of two times the energy in front to help keep the normalization condition uh, invariant. Hmm? I have to do the same to the completeness relation. That one I won't prove, but it's easy to see that now I, if the normalization has this factor, I also need to include a similar factor In the denominator here, I have to have this 2 EP uh, e here because when I apply states to the left and to the right of these, I'll get factors of square root of, of 2 EP. So I, I need this to, to cancel out. So this will be my normalization condition from now on. I mean my completeness relation from now on. And that that deals with uh, the normalization. Now we have to see how observables, right? How brackets transform under Lorentz boosts. Right? I have to be careful on what it was pretty clear what I mean by scalar field when it was just a field, a function. Now it is a, an operator, right? So I want to be careful with that. I I I, I want to know how this. Both the states and, and the operators transform under Lorentz uh, boosts. So take, for instance, uh, I state, so this is a Lorentz, Lorentz transformation and this is a momentum. So I'm talking this, uh, the, whatever is the state I get if I start state P and I transform it through a Lorentz transformation, right? And I'll write this as some unitary operator acting on P. Right? I know this needs to be unitary from the properties of the, the Lorentz transformation. And I have just chosen, uh, I have just uh, um, selected a, a um, normalization so that if I do the same Lorentz transformation to two states in a bracket, I know this is equal to this, right? Because now I have an invariant normalization up there. Mm -hmm. But what, what about the scalar field? What about the scalar um, operator now? 
right? What does it mean to demand that it is a scalar? So in terms of the classical fields, the condition I had was the cl classical in the sense of non, not quantized, right? Is that ec uh, the phi prime, and now I'm in using classical, this is my classical, it's supposed to be a CL, but it ends looking like, I don't know what that looks like, but that's classical, right? it's a new letter I'm creating here. And I, I, I did this same the same Lorentz transformation here. So I have phi prime of x prime, x prime is the finite lambda x, this is the Lorentz transformation. Right? And I said this uh, is under some representation of the Lorentz group that relates a phi classical of x in the previous reference frame. And I say to be scalar means this is one, right? So there's just no change. Right? Now, in the quantum version of the theory, in the quantized version of the theory, the only thing I can see is the value of, or the expectation value of this uh, operator. Now I'm using operator to distinguish, right? Under some state, right? Under some, some state, right? This is the equivalent thing to this, right? To phi classical of x. Right? So that's what I can observe. Right? Repeat the experiment many times, I can get this, this number. Right? So now, this guy being equal to this one will actually mean, if I use these transformations here, right? will actually mean that this needs to be. So, Psi, let me color code stuff here, just to make clear what the idea is. So, these guys on the left will transform by some unitary transformation, which is acting to the left, so it's inverse of this, right? The guy on the right is similar, right? Uh, it's just the same uh, Lorentz uh, transformation acting on this. So this is the transformed state, this is also the transformed state. That means if the two expressions are to be the same, the scalar uh, field, now an operator, actually needs to transform and it needs to transform in a very specific way, right? So, whenever I actually find what is the transformation for the states, then I'll find what is the transformation for the operator of the scalar field. It's the expect expectation value of the field that does not change, because the, the states do change, right? And, and, and that's what mean to, means to be a scalar field um, in this um, quantized theory. In fact, I can use these relations to find uh, uh, a, a little bit more about the act, uh, how these, these uh, operators act in practice to make this transformation. So I, for instance, I can, I can take this expression here and look it more deeply. Uh, and I can get a lot of uh, information out of that. So, looking only at the left-hand side here, it's, uh, again, let me make this very explicit as to not cause confusion. If I, I just take momentum P prime here, defined by lambda P, and use the definition of, of, of how this acts on the vacuum. This is just square root of two energy of the momentum lambda p times a dagger of lambda p acting on the vacuum. Right? That's the left-hand side 
I just use the definition of this one particle state with momentum lambda p. Right? On the right hand side, I can do the same. Right? I can have, I'll just copy u of lambda, forget the, the equal here, and use the definition for this guy, the same definition, right? It's the square root of two energy of momentum p times a dagger p acting on the vacuum, right? Since it's the vacuum is the same, this two operators need to to that need to be the same and that's that's the assumption too right the vacuum the empty space is 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 invariant on the Lorentz transformation okay. now what what can i do i can insert uh u minus 1 of lambda u of lambda here u of lambda acting on the vacuum is the vacuum again this is an assumption of the theory that that the theory we are something assuming something pretty deep here first i'm assuming the theory is invariant under Lorentz transformation and now i'm assuming that the vacuum of the theory is also invariant at the Lorentz transformation. In other words, I'm assuming the Lorentz transformation is not uh, spontaneously broken. For those of you already familiar with spontaneous symmetry breaking, if I had a vacuum that didn't respect the symmetry of the theory, right? I could. Uh, there are situations when that happened. The most famous example nowadays is the standard model for a particular symmetry, then I would spontaneously break the symmetry. I'm not doing that here. I don't want to break Lorentz invariance, right? So then the vacuum must satisfy this. I can put this in and I end up with a relation which is that this guy needs to be the same as this Oops. Multiply by this one, because the other one I absorbed in the vacuum, and I can uh, manipulate this a little bit to to leave it in the way I want it to be. So let's. Um, Put, let me see what's the best way of putting this. Yeah, I'll just bring this over here. All right. This one comes here. All right. And I can finally write without so many colors the final expression that interests me. That's how U acts on a dagger P which is an operator, so in, in here you start seeing, right, when I have states, I just act with the unitary transformation on the state, and operators, are, you, you act on both sides of the, the transformation, right? And this is equal to square root of E lambda P over E of P, right, this expression here, the times A dagger of lambda P, which tells me how the A daggers transform, and if I want the same expression for A without the dagger, I just have to take the dagger of the whole expression. Right. It is that easy. Mm -hmm. And that's important expression for us. Let me put it in a box. Because now that I know how the A's and the A daggers transform, I can get the transformation for phi. I needs to satisfy that, that that relation that I show up here. And it does, in fact, right? I can apply U and U minus 1 in here and and I know how phi transforms. Yeah. Um, and that's the, that, that's the next step, actually. I, I, now I need to, to put phi 
of x t in a more um, covariant um, form. Right? I, I need to know how it transforms. So the last time we look at this, we had taken some steps in that direction. So I had an integral d3p. So this 3 is one of the parts I want to fix. I want integrals over 4 momentum, not 3 momentum. Another part I want to fix is this energy right here. Right, so there's energy showing up explicitly here, which is not invariant. Uh, it's not the same in every referential. Right? A P exponential of minus I P X, and this is the part I I said we took some steps into putting into some. Uh, uh, relativistic uh, friendly notation, right? This is already a four momentum uh, product, so it's it's invariant under Lorentz transformations. And then I have a dagger p, same thing with the exponential here, and p zero equal e p. All right. So now I want to use what I know here to 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 help put these into an even more relativistic, uh, friendly way, right? Form. So what I can do, first thing, is to multiply here by square root of 2EP in the denominator and the numerator. That helps me a bit because, one, I have this object that shows up here, which I'll show uh, in what follows that is, uh, is pretty interesting to us. So I got rid of this square root. I have now 2EP here and I have thrown a square root inside. So now I have uh, factor 2 here that I'll leave here for now. Square root of 2 actually. Square root of 2 times square root of EP AP exponential minus EP x plus square root of ep a dagger p exponential of e i p x p0 equal to ep hmm. now remember that uh, these guys if i look at this expression right, i can throw this square root of EP to this side. And I know this is the inverse uh, of this transformation. So I can basically write this thing here as uh, U minus 1 lambda. Let me bring the expression back. get rid of myself uh, so you can compare right I can write this guy just throw it there multiply by invert the use the, the unitary transformation and I can write this as square root of e lambda p a dagger lambda p u of lambda Right, this is the same as this, now in a different referential, right? And I can do the same, of course, uh, here. Of course, this is without a dagger, sorry. And this would be the expression for the dagger one on the right here. So the same, I could do the same with this guy. What I really want is for this relation up here to be true, right? This one which tells me that um, phi prime of x prime is equal to what I had there, right? This one, right? But look, uh, let me keep this over here. But look what I'm, what I'm getting, getting here, right? So I'm getting that phi of x t, let's call this phi of x, or position is equal. I can bring this 1 minus 1 to the left. I can bring 
u of lambda to the right because they are appearing here and here right and i have something in the middle which according to this relation right i just have to throw u and u lambda and u lambda minus one to the other side i should have phi prime x prime here so that these two this, this relation is just the same as these, right, with the u's on the other side. Uh, and, 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 and for that to be true, right, for phi prime x prime to appear here in the middle, right, what do I need? Okay, so here I already have the energy of p prime. Here I also have a of p prime. This is Lorentz invariant, right? This is scalar, so I can put primes for free here. Hmm. But now I need this part, you know, this this part uh, right here to also be invariant because then the whole transformation is coming just from these two pieces in yellow, and I have this relation satisfied. Because then, if this is also invariant, I can put primes what I where I need here, and I'll have this relation. So essentially, what I have to prove here is that this part is also Lorentz invariant. Let's take a look at this. It's not immediately obvious, right? D3P is not invariant under, under Lorentz boosts, nor is the energy. But I can write this integral in a very uh, smart way as D. 4p, now it's 4 momentum, 2 pi to the 4th times 2 pi, this is just to compensate for this, times a Dirac delta of p square minus m square, and I'm integrating for p0 bigger than 0, right? So, now I have now I have a, a interesting expression, if it is true, right? I still didn't show this is true, but this, if it is true, this is invariant under Lorentz uh, transformations, because Lorentz transformations are just rotations in four-dimensional space, right? Minkowski space, and rotations do not change lengths of things, so it doesn't change the, the integration measure, right? It's just a rotation. And this is invariant too, right? So this whole thing is invariant. Hmm? And and now uh, I have to prove this in this direction. This is also easy to see. I'm not spending too much time in it. It's just the fact that this uh, this uh, Dirac delta I can write it like this, right? It's just expanding p square in terms of p0, p0 square minus the vector, this is just EP. And then, of course, I have to integrate in dP0 to go back to there, right? But this is the delta of P0 square, so I have to use that common, very useful relation of deltas to write this as a delta of P0 minus EP, and that's where the two, uh, 1 over 2 P0 comes from. And then when I do the integration, I get this 2 EP. Right. So I can I can it's actually easier to prove that I starting on the side I go to that side. Right. The fact that I only have invariant stuff in here that it means that this this integration measure here is invariant in the sense that if suppose I take a function, any function, which is Lorentz invariant. So under a boost or a Lorentz transformation. That, that function goes into itself. This is invariant. That means that if I put that function inside this integral, f p over 2 e p, then this will also go into the same expression. Right? Nothing will change. I can just put primes or remove primes at will. Right? 
So this is very useful. I, we can use these, keep these integrals in this form, but usually, I mean, it will, it will go back and forth. Sometimes it's just better to, to keep it that way. But keep in mind, I mean, this is Lorentz invariant. That's an important thing to know. Hmm? Now, finally, right, we can re rewrite x, phi of x in terms of this integral if we want, right, which uh, can be written um, like this. So phi of x will be d4 pi, p or 2p to the fourth. I keep this 2 pi here, delta p square minus m square, hmm. p0 bigger than 0, right? times square root of 2e p a of p exponential of minus i px plus square root of 2 ep a dagger of p exponential i px. I could put these, right? But this is redundant now because it's guaranteed by the this delta function, right? It actually imposes that. Right. And this is another way of writing phi of x, which is which is useful because show it shows that it transforms in the way a scalar field should transform, which is this one. Right. This is the transformation we want, and this is explicit because we know how these two guys uh, transform. And then you can see that this is a scalar field. Okay, so finally, the last uh, thing uh, I want to to talk about today, and and it, that will take us yet one more step in the direction of interpreting these as particles, is the following: take this um, expression of the phi that I had before. I right? didn't see it just just got this one and I'm already using the previous one. So you see it's 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 all convenience, right? Take this one. This is uh, actually a, a Heisenberg picture operator, right? Because it's evolving in time. Time evolution is hidden inside these exponentials here. Uh, now let's let's define the Schrodinger picture operator uh, which can be obtained by just evolving. This, since this is an operator, and the evolution needs to be done. Uh, yeah, this is Heisenberg picture, this is Schrodinger picture. This is just the three position, this is the four position. Uh, and uh, it's not hard to show by using the commutation relations of A and A dagger with the Hamiltonian that this is true this one, exponential of a, p, exponential of e, h, t is equal to a dagger, oh, a, p, i, e, p, t. Just have to use the commutation relations and you can show that. And, and there's a similar one for a dagger. If I put dagger here, dagger here and change this sign of course. Huh? It's also true and that means that when I go to the Schrodinger picture these of course these Hamiltonians will come here uh, I mean here and in this case this uh, time evolution will cancel out the time evolution that is here because it's the same with the opposite sign and it's same here so I just get rid of the when I do that, I basically just take away the exponential with the time evolution, right? The, the Hamiltonian commits with everything else. The only operators in here are a and a dagger. I can actually put operator hats in everyone, so it makes more explicit. 
Huh? That means that uh, when I go to Schrodinger picture, I just have to remove the time evolution from here. And I, then I don't need this anymore. Uh, and then I want to take this guy, right, which is this one, without the time part in the exponentials, and apply it to the vacuum. Right, so take phi of x. I won't be carrying this. Schrodinger here, but it's, it's, it's implicit in the fact that it does not depend on time. And act on zero. I'm acting this guy on the vacuum. I don't have to worry about the A part, because only A dagger matters here. Hmm? Only A dagger matters. I, this guy will be zero in the vacuum. So this will be the integral. Well, I get I get when I act with this guy on the vacuum. Remember, there's a normalization for these states, right? I'll, I'll get an extra power of one over square root of two e p from the normalization of this guy acting on the vacuum, and that will give me p. Right? That's why I I brought out. I have to put an extra power in there too. To, to really get the creation. And then the, the space part of this exponential, which of course has the opposite sign to the time part in the metric I'm using. This is minus i p x. So you see, the effect of the field acting on the vacuum is to create this very particular state, right? This is a, a state which is a combination of many different well-defined momentum states. So have all possible momentum here, right? Uh, and, 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 and the combination of them gives me a state which is uh, has a, a well-defined position, let's say. This is very similar to what we used to call in non-relativistic quantum mechanics the eigenstates of position, right? We had states like that in, in quantum mechanics and, and, and this is actually very similar to those. And that's why we, we say that, we, it, in the jargon of the area, we say that phi of x is creating a particle at position x. Right? This is the closest we have to uh, eigenstate of the position operator. Right? To, to, to make that interpretation even more solid, remember that in, in quantum mechanics, we used to do that to get the wave function of a state with well-defined momenta projected in the position space. Right? We used to get E of uh, Px there, right? Let's see what happens if I take this state. Now let's throw it to the other side, right? This is real, so phi dagger is equal to, to phi. Uh, let me throw it to the other side and then project a well-defined, now a well-defined momentum state in here, right? In this, uh, uh, what I'm calling a uh, uh, position state, right? Um, Let's see what happens. So I have to rewrite this integral. I cannot use p because this p is a variable of integration. So I use p prime. Right? So I just get all of these again. But I have to use p prime. Oops. p prime, p prime, p prime. Right? And of course, since I took the dagger. This is what I get now. Of course, I'm acting this on the other side, so um, so now I have, yeah, I have the opposite uh, exponential. And here I get, I get p prime p, and of course I know the normalization condition for this, right? This is just we have to remember that we have a relativistic normalization now. So there's a 2EP here. There's a 2 pi to the cube because there's momentum. There's a d delta 3P 
minus p prime and i can use that to do this integral and uh, energies go away once p is equal to p prime and i get just the exponential of i p x right which reinforces that idea right that this is actually i'm projecting a projecting a wave function of this uh, uh, well-defined momentum state in position space, right? And actually, the the wave function, which is a plane wave, right, propagating in x, is actually exactly what I expected from a particle with momentum p, right, with very well-defined momentum p. So again, that reinforces my interpretation. And again, this p is related to the energy of the same particle by the relativistic dispersion relation. So we start to see a picture arising here that I can have excitations of this quantized field that are, are, are very similar to particles, right? Well, I still have to define this further, but and also we are talking about only the free theory and that's uh, a big caveat here that we will have to address eventually, but uh, it's important to see the picture there's arising um, in this formula. So I think that that's it for today. Let me see if I forget anything. No, I, I, I didn't. So that's it. Uh, see you next time.